An Ashiana Airlines plane has skidded off a runway at Hiroshima Airport in western Japan. The passengers and crew were evacuated. More than 20 people were injured. Investigators in Japan and South Korea say they'll begin their probe on Wednesday. Transport officials say the Airbus A320 came to a stop facing the opposite direction on Tuesday. They say there was a report that the tail section of the plane touched the runway during landing, triggering sparks. They add the engine on the left side and part of the wing have been damaged. Airline representatives say 74 passengers and eight crew members were on board. 46 are from Japan. Others are from such countries as China, South Korea, the United States, Canada and Sweden. The rescuers say 22 people suffered injuries, mostly minor. The plane started rattling. I looked outside and saw the wing was broken. I saw a fire coming out and smelled something burning. The plane dropped suddenly before it landed. Ashiana Airlines Flight 162 originated from Incheon Airport in South Korea. Japanese transport safety officials suspect the jet flew at an abnormally low altitude before skidding off the runway. They say that during its descent, the plane apparently clipped a radio communication structure 300 meters from the runway. They also say they found a fragment of the structure on the aircraft's left wheel. The facility is about six meters high, much lower than the usual flight course of incoming planes. Officials at Hiroshima Airport say the runway has been closed since Tuesday night and they do not know when it can be reopened. Dozens of flights have already been canceled. Airlines fear there may be more cancellations. A court in central Japan has ordered the operator of the Takama nuclear plant not to restart its reactors. It's the first time for a judge to issue this kind of injunction in the country. The ruling asserts the reactors are not safe in regards to earthquakes, even though regulators said the plant is in compliance with requirements. More from NHK World's Noriko Okada. Residents broke into applause outside the Fukui District Court. They filed the case in December. They say they won a historic victory. To completely stop reactors three and four at the Takahama plant. It's the best decision we could ever imagine. Executives at Kansai Electric argue they've taken sufficient measures to restart the two reactors at the Takahama plant. But the judge decided the executives were too optimistic. They assumed a quake beyond predicted levels would not occur. All of Japan's 48 reactors remain offline. 2011 Fukushima nuclear accident forced the industry to reform its governance. The Nuclear Regulation Authority started examining plans two years ago under new stricter rules. So far, 24 reactors from 15 plants have applied for reinstatement. Last September, NRA officials approved two reactors at the Sendai nuclear power plant. The operator hopes for a restart later this year after NRA on-site inspections clear the facilities. In February, the Takahama reactors met the NRA requirements, making it the second plant in the country on the way to a restart. But the court has cast serious doubt on NRA standards. NRA officials say an accident could occur at the plant even if it meets the standards. They maintain a plant is never completely safe. Today, the judge ruled the NRA's new requirements are too lax. He added that stricter standards should be introduced to ensure severe accidents never happen again. A key point of contention is how strong a quake could hit the plant. Three faults ran nearby. The operator initially submitted 550 gals as a quick strength figure. NRA officials rejected the figure as too optimistic. The utility raised it to 700 gals. It then got the OK from the NRA. But residents objected. it. They point out more than 4,000 gals came about in an earthquake that hit the country's northeast in 2008. 
They also note the operator had said the facility might be damaged by a quake over 970 yards. The residents argue the Takahama plant would likely melt down if it were struck by a big quake. Leaders in Tokyo say the government will closely watch what the operator does. The NRA is an independent organization, and it's taken plenty of time to judge if the plant meets what people call the world's toughest safety standards. The government will respect the assessment. The ruling will not affect our position on restarting the plant after it gets approval. The Takahama plant cannot go online unless the injection is overturned. Kansai Electric executives are considering filing a request to suspend the order. NRA officials say the injunction will not affect administrative procedures like screenings and inspections. The operator plans to continue steps to restart reactors. But one thing is clear. The court's decision has brought into question the country's safety standards. It may reignite a national debate about nuclear energy in Japan's future. The forecast for East Asia, we begin in Japan because this is where most of the activity is happening when it comes to the rain. You can see the spin of the low pressure system south of the Korean Peninsula. That's driving down the colder air, especially for the higher levels of the atmosphere. When you have a higher area of cold weather and then warm air down toward the ground level, that becomes very unstable. And that's when we have thunderstorms popping up from time to time. So look out for the possibility as we go throughout the overnight period into Wednesday for some hail risks, also lightning, strong gusts, and cannot rule out that isolated tornado because of the spin taking place. The dynamics are in place where we may see that taking place. The operator place. of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in northeastern Japan is now facing another hurdle. They've given up retrieving a robotic probe that remains stationary inside one of the reactors. Tokyo Electric Power Company engineers inserted the remote-controlled robot for the first time on Friday into the containment vessel of the number one reactor through a pipe. The snake-like machine was supposed to survey internal damage to the vessel, but it stalled after moving about 10 meters. They suspect the robot itself, or its remote control cable, has become caught on something. The engineers operated its maneuvering belt and manually pulled the robot's cable, but it's not showing any sign of being able to move. TEPCO officials had scheduled a similar survey on Monday on the same vessel using another robot, but they postponed that plan because the first robot's cable is blocking the entry for the second probe. The utility says it hasn't decided when it will conduct the second survey. Engineers at Fukushima Daiichi in northeastern Japan have been trying to locate melted nuclear fuel inside a damaged reactor. They sent in a robotic camera last week, which they had to abandon after it got stuck. But it was able to send back helpful data, the first ever pictures of the interior of the containment vessel. Tokyo Electric Power Company engineers inserted the remote controlled robot into the number one reactor through a pipe. The snake like machine is designed to navigate around obstacles. It got stuck after moving a little more than 10 meters, but not before capturing important footage. Debris and machine parts are on its path. The temperature is reading at 20 degrees, and steam can be seen rising. Experts say water at the bottom of the vessel is evaporating due to the heat generated by the melted nuclear fuel. The radiation level is reaching 10 sieverts per hour in some places. The dose is deadly after 40 minutes of exposure. At one point, the reading shoots above 20 sieverts. TEPCO says they will analyze the footage to try to find ways to remove the molten fuel. The reactor melted down following an earthquake and tsunami four years ago.
Thanks, Sai, for that. A new poll by NHK suggests people in Japan are divided over changing the constitution. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has indicated he wants to amend the charter. NHK conducted a survey by telephone over three days. More than 1,000 people agreed to take part. About 33% of respondents said they agree with the idea of amending the constitution. 31% said it's unnecessary and 27% were undecided. The survey also asked about the government's policy on nuclear power plants. Officials want to restart facilities whose safety is confirmed by regulators. 47% of people polled said they oppose the idea. That compares with 22% who approve. And 25% said they haven't made up their minds about the issue. Japanese leaders are hammering out a compromise to cut the country's greenhouse gases by the year 2030. They're targeting a reduction of 20 to 30 percent. The new plan comes as leaders disagree on how much to cut. Environment Ministry officials want a 30 percent decrease, but officials with the Ministry of Industry say that's too high. They want a reduction of 15 percent instead. They say a higher number will put too much pressure on industry. They're trying to negotiate a compromise of 20 percent or more. Observers say it will require more power from renewable energy sources and nuclear plants. But officials say renewables could lead to higher costs, and there has been strong opposition to nuclear power. Officials from Japan and other countries must submit their targets to the UN before a year-end conference. The United States and all European Union members have already turned in their plans. The EU goal calls for at least a 40 percent cut by 2030. The of Japan, China and South Korea have held three-way talks for the first time in four years. They say they'll work together to boost the number of visitors among their nations. Japan's minister in charge of tourism, Akihiro Ota, Chinese vice minister of commerce, Lee Jinzhao, and South Korean tourism minister Kim Jong-dok met in Tokyo. They set the goal of increasing the annual number of tourists from the current 20.47 million to 30 million by 2020. They plan to increase the number of flights to achieve this goal. The ministers also hope to take advantage of the 2018 Winter Olympics and Paralympics in South Korea and the Summer Games in Tokyo in 2020 to boost the number of visitors. I think it's meaningful the three tourism ministers held a meeting for the first time in four years. Ota says he believes the meeting will have a positive impact on improving diplomatic relations among the governments. Taiwan is keeping an eye on food imports from Japan. We have Jean Otani from the business desk here. So, Jean, what about it? Well, once again, we're talking about radiation fears here, and they have led to authorities in Taiwan to ban food products from Fukushima and four nearby prefectures. But last month, inspectors found that products from those areas had made it through customs, and officials are tightening import regulations in response. Taiwanese health authorities will now require labels on all Japanese food products to identify the prefectures they came from. They'll also require radiation checks on certain items, including food for infants. They say they'll release details on the measures and implement them as early as next month. The new regulations were first proposed last year, but they were put on hold due to opposition from Japan. Taiwan is the third largest importer of Japanese foods after Hong Kong and the United States. More people in Japan are turning away from green tea, so makers of the traditional drink are looking for ways to brew up new sales. Some are heading overseas and taking new products with them. Managers at this tea company have been recruiting international students for three-month internships. They want the interns to learn all about green tea, then promote it back home. This year, they're training three young people from the United States, France, and Indonesia. Company instructors teach them how to cultivate the tea. This is new sprout, baby, baby sprout. He is preparing to grow up. Company instructors tell them everything they know about green tea. This includes the best way to brew it and serve it. Use the same tea leaves on a different temperature and the taste is different. 35 students from 13 countries have completed the internship. 
four former interns are now importing tea leaves to their home countries. In the future, I would love to open my own uh, coffee shop. I will sell a lot of things, and one of those things will be uh, Japanese tea. Company managers have hired Simona from Lithuania after her internship ended. She now manages the English version of the company's website. The site explains how different seasons and tea breeds change the taste of the drink. Simona has also spearheaded an increase in special tours by the company for international visitors. Over 300 people joined the tea tours last year. They visited tea fields and tasted several varieties of the drink. And we noticed that our, uh, the number of people who are interested in Japanese green tea is um, growing. I really want to um, uh, expand Japanese tea even more to bring it to the world. So far, the internship program has been a success for the tea company. Last year, sales to overseas customers quadrupled, with shipments going out to 65 countries. Our mission is to bring Japanese tea to the world. We want to convey the appeal of authentic green tea to customers overseas. Other companies are fighting shrinking demand for green tea by developing new products. People at this long-established tea maker have invented a new seasoning that uses green tea. It's a green chili and salt mixture that has the rich aroma of tea. In the company's cafe, chefs serve up a pasta that's flavored with the special seasoning. Pasta with tomato or cream sauce tends to be heavy, but tea pasta is light and delicious. The tea maker has also developed cosmetics that are infused with green tea. The key ingredient, tea seeds. Tea seeds are rich in nutrients that help keep the skin moist. Workers extract oil from the seeds and put it in a skin care product. The cosmetics has been a hit. A luxury spa in a major hotel in Japan will soon feature the product. We want to create a greater variety of tea products. We hope to sell them in Japan and overseas. A traditional Japanese drink that's getting untraditional treatment. From the farm to the laboratory, green tea producers are making every effort to survive. Managers at Japanese firms in China are seeing a surge in interest from job hunting students. And they say the newfound enthusiasm is due to improving relations between the countries. Officials with the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry in China host a job fair in Beijing twice a year. They say their latest event attracted more than twice as many students as last time. Representatives from 16 Japanese companies in cosmetic, auto related, and other industries took part. More than 700 students set to graduate from universities and graduate schools attended. Many said they're keen to work for a Japanese firm. I want to go to Japan again if it's possible, since I studied abroad there for a year. I also have a good image of Japan. I saw many students who we'd really like to hire. Organizers say Chinese people are hopeful economic ties will strengthen as diplomatic relations. Visitors to the world's largest broadcast equipment fair are getting a glimpse of the future of television and seeing what next generation HK high resolution technology can do. More than 1,700 companies from across the globe are participating in the event in Las Vegas. New products include drones for shooting video and cameras and displays that are compatible with H8K high definition TV. This technology can deliver images at 16 times the resolution of today's high definition TVs. NHK showed a documentary shot with the HK or 8K rather camera it's uh, developed. The documentary depicts the lives of evacuees from the area around the Fukushima nuclear power plant 
It also features cherry blossoms and workers engaged in decontamination work. The movie was shown on a 350-inch screen. Very good pictures and a very, very good story that they told with it. It's really left a good impression, really deep. The sound is unbelievable. The colors are so vibrant, and it's really the future. NHK aims to put its 8K technology to full broadcasting use in 2020 when Tokyo hosts this Summer Olympic Japan's Games. Japan's ruling coalition have met to hammer out the details of the country's new security legislation. It would enable the country to exercise the right to collective self-defense. The Liberal Democratic Party and its junior partner, Komei Cho, took part. Government officials proposed allowing Japanese ministers to confer by telephone during so-called gray zone situations. The term refers to infringements of sovereignty that do not amount to armed attacks. Officials said speaking by phone could help ministers speed up their response. For instance, they said orders could be issued to dispatch self-defense force personnel for maritime security. They said an example would be an armed group landing illegally on a remote island. No one at the meeting raised any objections. Coalition members also discussed a planned permanent law that would allow the SDF to provide logistical support to foreign troops. LDP and Komeito representatives were divided over whether approval by the Diet would be required before dispatching SDF personnel. LDP members said Diet approval could come later. They said that would enable leaders to respond quickly when the Diet was not in session or when the lower house had been dissolved. But Komeito members said prior diet approval should be required without exception. Coalition members plan to meet about twice a week. They hope to gain cabinet approval for the relevant bills by the middle of next month. Seven years ago, U.S. forces launched an amphibious assault on the island of Okinawa. Almost 100,000 civilians died in the battle. The Imperial Japanese Army forced many civilians to serve on the front line. Among them was a unit of teenage girls called the Himeyuri Corps. Very few members of this unit are alive today, and they're determined not to let their story be forgotten. NHK World's Shinichiro Kuninaka has the story. The Himeyuri Corps was a unit composed of teenage schoolgirls. They were sent to the front line during the Battle of Okinawa to treat wounded soldiers. 87-year-old Yoshiko Shimabukuro is one of the group's survivors. That chubby one is me. Many of us died in the battle. This girl and that girl, these ones are all dead. The girls worked in makeshift hospitals set up in caves. As the fighting became desperate for the Imperial Japanese Army, the soldiers left the 222 teenagers to fend for themselves. More than half died. For decades, Shimabukuro and fellow survivors have fought another battle to make sure the world wouldn't forget. They built a museum and held regular sessions of storytelling to convey their experiences. 20 million people have visited so far. Using the strength she had left, my friend managed to say, I don't think I'll survive, so please treat the others first. Her eyes and mouth were already closed. But when I told her I had brought water, she drank it, and she died a couple of minutes later. AIDS has taken its toll on the survivors. In March, Shimabukuro and her colleagues decided to reduce their involvement in storytelling. But there's something else that worries them. Visitors are invited to write about their impressions. And recently, Shimabukuro found troubling comments. The world really has changed. If we stop doing this, people will forget and war will return. 
The foremost concern among the Himeiri survivors is to ensure that their collective memory remains alive. That's why they have been training a new generation of storytellers. Please tell us what you think of our presentations. The young women describe in vivid detail the ordeal of the Himeuri course 70 years ago. You did well today. You were relaxed. Keep up the good work. I'd like to be able to speak in a way that conveys how the survivors see their own experience of war. The new generation of storytellers started taking over in April. Shimabukuro hopes their efforts will reach beyond Okinawa and touch people who remain indifferent to what happened there during World War II.